gut aus. <coughs> so, uh, uh, as, uh, sorry, apologies, my voice kind of faded today. So one thing that didn't scale well is my voice. <coughs> so I'll try to keep it short today. Um, I will tell you a little bit about how we scale uh, the operations of Atlassian stacks on top of AWS. Um, I will go into like a little introduction of who I am, where I work for, um, what the deployment opt uh, options are that we have with the Atlassian software, um, what scenarios we usually have to support in operations, um, what kind of uh, tales from the trenches we are basically faced with in day-to-day -day operations, and what our secret sauce is to basically conquer all these different um, like scenarios that we have to face day-to-day. So, um, my name is Daniel Meisen. I work for Kreuzwerker. Uh, I'm at least an authorized instructor and certified professional. Um, and basically, I am also an avid Atlassian user from the very early days of Atlassian. So, I mean, um, Patrick already showed you how uh, Jira and Confluence can look nice, or Jira Service Desk might look nice. That is how it looked like um, the day I started with Jira. So, it looked a little different. Um, so, same goes co to Confluence, so that was basically the user interface at the times um, when I started 16 years ago. And uh, it's filled with all the funny uh, release notes, um, some of them still from Mike and Scott, like the, the founders of Atlassian. Um, and for version 1, for example, they had to drop uh, emoji support um, because page rendering was too slow. So, I guess they have different problems now in terms of scale and operations. Huh? It's from last week, I guess. It's Confluence 7, 8 or something, so, yeah. And then, uh, obviously, uh, like, the, the widespread adoption of Atlassian has changed over the past 16 years, which you can pretty see also along, uh, like, everyday people. So I don't know if you know her. It's Jessica Alba. Let me see if I can uh, play the video. There is no sound. So <coughs> b b basically, uh, Jira has somewhat arrived with everyday users, um, such as Jessica Alba. So she she basically said she can't code, but she can put everything in a Jira ticket. Um, well, uh, let's see. Next slide. So um, the company I work for, Kreuzwerker, doesn't always look like this, but in summer it sometimes does. Um, we're basically a consulting and operations company. Um, uh, it's currently better. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, we are uh, 90 people strong. We have offices in uh, in Zurich, in Munich, in Warsaw as well. Um, and uh, like the the main topics uh, that we work in is basically less in consulting, operations, uh, cloud engineering, and innovation services. So let's dive into the topic. Um, I mean, uh, Patrick was talking about. Um, uh, Atlassian, uh, how it's operated here, which is basically on-premise, and with on-premise operations, you have the, the choice between server, like uh, single, single node deployments, or data center, which is either single node or multi-node deployments, or you can choose the, um, the, the native cloud offering that Atlassian ha has, which basically comes in two flavors. Um, which is either um, uh, like the standard cloud offering or the newly added uh, cloud premium offering that Atlassian has. The main differentiator between both offerings is um, enterprise support in terms of SLAs. So basically with uh, the Atlassian premium cloud, um, you get dedicated SLAs, you get a little bit um, uh, like more features tailored towards enterprise use, such as um, you can choose data locality, bring your custom domains and these kind of things, which wasn't possible with the with the cloud offering in the past. Um, but obviously, there's, there's still a huge gap between um, what, what you can and cannot do in cloud and what you can and cannot do with the on-prem um, installations of, uh, of Atlassian. And with the integral role these, these tools play in companies today, um, like you are faced with scenarios in day-to-day -day operations, uh, especially in, in regards of compliance and security, we really have to consider, are you the right guy to operate the tool stack yourself, or is this someone you want to trust someone else with, uh, who's basically his day job or her day job is it, to operate at less in stacks at scale? Um, and then again, is this Atlassian? Like, are, are you fine with the with the features that you get from the cloud, or is the cloud tailored toward your level of compliance that, that you need in your organization? 
so the main question is why why would you um, choose something like a managed service? And um, like one of the unique selling points obviously is you get the convenience of the cloud offering. Um, so you don't have to operate it yourself. Um, it, it feels like someone else is managing it for you, but you get the full feature set of servant data center applications, um, especially in regards to integratability. So like this um, uh, and border or like all other different uh, integrations that you have with um, like usually business intelligence tools or other HR um, or payroll applications that you want to deeply integrate with, um, that is not always possible with, with the cloud offering, especially if those tools uh, reside on-prem within your network and cannot talk to the outside world, for example. Um, plus, what you definitely want is something like a dedicated operations team, for example, that, that, is, that is skilled enough to, um, to tackle all the, uh, let's say, all, all the bad things that can come to your instance in terms of uh, being, being either threats um, from, from an attack level or uh, just like security incidents that might happen. Plus you have full control over data locality obviously because if, if you have someone who operates that for you, you can pick where the, the your data should reside. Um, coming to the scenarios, so basically if you operate stacks at scale, um, there is like these kind of day-to-day -day scenarios that, that you might be facing with as an operator. Um, like usually backup and restore, that has to work. Like there is data loss um, if, if someone accidentally deleted a project and shouldn't, um, like gone is gone, there is no safe delete, there is, no, there is no, no trash bin or anything where you can recover a deleted project. So you want to have a working and tested and proven backup and, and especially restore mechanism to get that data back. Um, then again, if, if you operate multiple stacks in a fast growing environment, um, you might want to copy and clone out environments to test certain thing roll out an upgrade of, of a newer release to test if, if all this goes well. Um, there might be different units within your company um, that, that well have their uh, like shadow hardware or shadow uh, software under under the desk and, and, and you're faced with migrating data either from other Atlassian tools or uh, external tools like OTRS or other ticketing systems back into Jira. Or you want to integrate and extend. So like all these kind of scenarios is something that, that you as the one being responsible for operations in your company um, uh, want to be able to respond to. Um, then again, um, like what happens on a, on a more or less like weekly or monthly level, you want to be able to, to roll out either planned uh, release changes or uh, if, if at less in or any of the, the, the marketplace vendors releases a security advisory, you want to react fast and be able to roll out um, emer emergency changes or integrate additional applications. Um, I brought a little example that uh, happened nearly a year ago. Um, so there was this Confluence advisory in March last year, um, where basically um, uh, the, the WebDAV connector or like, like, a, like, like an add-on part of Confluence um, was exploitable to a degree that allowed remote code execution. So basically um, it's bad. And why was it so bad? Um, because there's a lot of instances out there exposed to the public internet that were affected for this being operated by people who weren't either not technically able or from an organization level not fast enough to be able to upgrade. And um, there's uh, like search engines out there um, such as uh, Rapid7 where you can actually just like, just like publicly search for those affected instances. Um, and there was roughly uh, 20,000 exposed instances out of which 2,500 were affected by that incident weeks after the release of the security advisory. So basically these are all instances that could have been easily exploited if someone wanted to. Um, and let's see how an unnamed company r responded to this. So basically they released, uh, they, they received the security advisory, um, like they pulled internally and like talked to less in in-house team said like, hey, I guess we, we, we need to upgrade because this looks bad. Um, so they, yeah, I mean, obviously they decide that they really want to upgrade. Um, so, well, everyone needs to be informed. They agree on, a, on, a, on an upgrade date um, because, well, they have to get, uh, go to the change advisory board. It takes some time, like happens, you know, it's even though it looks bad, it doesn't go as fast as they wanted to. Um, so they prepare the upgrade, um, roll it out, and it doesn't work. So, well, they spend the night and part of the weekend to roll back. And then suddenly we receive, uh, receive a call uh, a little later, um, uh, and then uh, they notice that the CPU spiked and they can't figure out why. 
well, um, like this exploit that I just mentioned in the security advisory was exploited on a very large scale um, because there was a Chinese group that rolled out uh, crypto miners uh, and used basically confluence instances to mine some cryptocurrency. Um, and they were obviously affected. So for us, this was um, like a very cheap, uh, let's say, um, new customer initiative. Um, like, but I wouldn't call it a campaign, but in the end, it turned out quite well for us. Um, so let's see how Atlassian uh, tells you that, that you should approach upgrades. So basically, Atlassian says um, a little prep goes a long way. And there's a pretty good talk that is linked down here um, from one of the, the previous summits, um, where one of the, um, one of the Atlassian employees um, shows how they handle larger upgrades. So ideally, you check the upgrade metrics, you read the release notes, you go through all the technical upgrade notes, um, check for supported platforms, like is the database that you're operating on or the operating system, the Java version, is it still supported um, by the version that you upgrade to? Um, then you also need to check like all the, the bordering effects, uh, such as infrastructure, um, like apps. Is there any, any of the supported apps that you have installed? Um, is it probably not supported by the, by the newer version or um, might there be any issue by the plugin vendor uh, for the specific vendor, uh, for the specific uh, upgrade version that you, that you target? Um, do you have customizations like with um, Patrick mentioned uh, Zill? Um, but there's also script runner and, and a lot of customers actually use this and, and heavily customize their instances even in a large scale. Um, this might break your neck if you do not carefully document them and want to check for them. So obviously you need to have a plan. So you um, create a staging environment, you upgrade that, you test it, um, you understand what's happening, if anything is breaking, check the logs, uh, create a runbook for the productive upgrade, um, test the runbook and modify it. And this is a lot of things that you need to take into consideration if you operate a single Atlassian stack in a larger organization. So, um, well, in the end, ideally all goes well and you see that dialogue that tells you um, uh, that, well, all is good, um, but let's see how we do this because that's a lot of work if, um, if you want to do this for hundreds of instances um, and not only for a single instance that you operate. So if, you, if you're tasked with operating not only one, but, but like 50 or 60 instances at the same time, um, you obviously need to parallelize and automate things. Um, so what we do is basically we assess uh, affected customers if we receive um, one, di uh, like one of the security advisories. Um, and there it helps to have uh, infrastructure as code. So all the operations that we do is basically um, fully automated to a degree that, that we have the infrastructure um, defining the environments that we operate as code so we can check what customers are running what versions and what customers are running basically what, what add-on versions and um, is, is there anything that prevents an automatic upgrade. So we have a little tool basically that, uh, that goes against all the instances, uh, scans for certain things such as the services installed, um, the versions of the services, um, like is the license still valid? Because if you upgrade with, a, with an invalid or expired license, that can also mean depending on the version, a bit of a pain afterwards. Um, what we call health, so we, as, uh, we assess is the instance healthy or is, is there already like a broken index or anything that, that might fall on our foot afterwards? And then especially, um, we also automatically check uh, add-on compatibility. Um, so what you see here in green is basically all the add-ons that are directly compatible with the target version. Uh, yellow ones would be, um, would be compatible if upgraded prior to the upgrade. And the red ones are incompatible, either because the, the plugin vendor hasn't released the version compatible with the target version or because it's not supported anymore or a custom add-on, for example. Um, then there's also a couple of things that you um, want to prevent um, in case you have to roll back. So what we also do is we disable mailing um, because we want to avoid that the tickets are either created by incoming mails or notifications are sent out in case we have to roll back. Um, we set an announcement banner so that everyone who didn't read the announcement mail that, that went through the organization prior to that um, still knows that there is actually a planned maintenance going on. Um, what we also do is um, uh, we will limit access if possible to only, let's say, a key group of users, which is possible if you have um, like dedicated network segments or different network segments within your organization, and then can limit this either by um, basic OS or based, based, based on IP ranges, for example. 
um, we will create a snapshot of the environment so that we can easily um, have some sort of point, point in time recovery at the moment that we started the upgrade. Um, we will mute all the alarms of our um, monitoring infrastructure and obviously notify the customer um, that we are now starting with the upgrade. Um, then basically we ex execute a little script um, and upgrade all our operations com components, which might be just the application itself or application plus infrastructure. So for example, it might be that we combine this with a database upgrade or uh, a Java upgrade. Um, after the upgrade, um, there is some validation of the, uh, like of the success of the upgrade. So we will uh, scan the log files for unexpected errors. Um, we will see if all the health checks um, are green, like is the instance up and running probably. Um, we will execute some post-upgrade um, post checks. Um, we might run re-index or, or cache warming depending on the product. Um, and uh, we run some, some uh, like optional manual checks. So for example, if there's heavy customization, there might be some exploratative, uh, exploratative uh, testing going on uh, depending on the use cases and, and customizations. And ideally, um, after the upgrade, all our customers see something like this, or the customer's administrators, and all is well, so upgraded. That was for a single instance. Um, so obviously, um, like for that particular uh, security um, advisory, we had to upgrade um, 64 instances uh, at the same time, and, and our, our SLA is basically we wanna upgrade in less than 24 hours for all our customers, um, which might involve um, a little lead communication, to actually inform them about the upgrade. Um, so there is just no way that we can all like all do this manually and all do this for 64 customers at the same time um, within 24 hours. So there is a fancy open source tool called GNU Parallel, which allows parallel execution of all of this. So basically uh, the operator just uh, goes through uh, like all the pre-upgrade checks um, assesses the amount of instances that we really need to upgrade, and then this runs on full auto. And he afterwards just checks our monitoring um, uh, for uh, yeah for known issues or for errors, um, and decides if there's any customers that we need to roll back to. Um, so what is the secret sauce actually? Well, it's not so secret to be honest. Um, so basically what we do is we operate all of these stacks on AWS mainly and the customer chooses where to have the data stored. It's mainly Frankfurt, but depending on the location of the customer, it might be different data centers as well. Um, what we do is from a security standpoint because customers um, customi customize their instances and if there's one compromised instance, we don't want to uh, get the attacker towards other instances. So basically, um, we have a single virtual private cloud, like, like a dedicated um, logical uh, piece of container per customer. Um, this is a bit more expensive in operation, but also way more secure than just like um, having them all in the same shared environment. Um, we have this flexible full auto provisioning that I just showed you. Um, we have side-to-side -side VPNs because the main pinpoint that you have is you always have some sort of active directory that is on-prem with the customer or you have that Tableau or Microsoft Power BI or whatever. So there might be other integrations on, on the customer premise that you need to integrate. So nearly every customer has a side-to-side -side VPN allowing a link back to the, to the network of the customer. Um, we have uh, AD integrations and uh, I guess one of the largest customers has uh, 16 or 70 ADs um, connected at the same time. Uh, because of different restructurings in the organization. So it's, it's, it's not a pattern that, that we basically recommend, but it's a pattern that happens uh, in enterprise uh, operations. So yeah, I mean, you have to deal with, we're just operating the stack. It's not we're that we're building the environment of the customer. Um, what we also do is we provide uh, like offsite backups. So for example, from, from a business continuity standpoint or disaster recovery, you might want to have a backup in your own premise. Like if the AWS goes down, if we go down, if anyone goes down, you want to sit on a recent backup to be able to restore locally. So we just like provide that to the customer securely. Um, and then I mentioned this earlier, we also have uh, like uh, a read-only database replica for a few of our customers for, um, let's say, resource-heavy business intelligence calculations or database queries that we do not want to run against the, the production database. So we can just like have a latency-free clone of the database um, as part of the environment that the customer can use for all their, like, let's say, custom stuff and custom queries against the database. Um, same goes for what we call deep health checks. So it's not 
not just a, uh, like all the LSM products, they um, they provide an endpoint that basically allows you to, to see if an instance is up and running, but just because you receive an HTTP 200 from that request doesn't mean that the product is working. And that's why we implemented like what we call deep health check to actually look inside the application and see if a login is possible, um, if, s if, if certain actions um, are possible, if the add-ons are activated and all these kind of things. Um, and that all basically, from, from an ingredient standpoint, um, is AWS, a lot of Terraform, Docker, Greylock for logs management, Datadog for, uh, for like application performance and infrastructure monitoring, New Relic for uptime. We could do this with Datadog as well, but it's just like awfully expensive. Um, we have some dead snitch alerts for infrastructure components failing and Opsgenie actually for the on-call duty. Um, and that allowed us basically with a very small team um, uh, during the last 12 months to execute 104 migrations, um, perform roughly 401 upgrades, um, at a little bit over 370,000 users, um, and at a little bit over 5.4 million issues, um, like with this limited set of customers. And well, I mean, in the end, why do we do all this? Because we want to operate with less. So ideally, um, the same team is not tasked with repetitive actions all day. Um, things that they can automate, they automate, and things um, that, that still require some manual labor will probably always stay the same. But these are just the recent CVEs. And, and uh, just this year, we already had like five uh, security advisories from uh, add-on vendors, uh, plus one product, two product advisories. So um, there's more and more coming. So basically, you need to be ready to upgrade fast and early. And ideally, uh, you have someone that, um, that basically has the confidence to upgrade, um, not going through like a nightmare or, uh, let's say, a fancy, yeah, a, a fancy story of, of your upgrade, um, like the one that I uh, showed earlier. Um, last but not least, some lessons learned of operating at Lessin Stacks for um, uh, quite some years now. What you always want to do is just like re reduce the, the number of versions that you operate. So for example, even if, if in your organizations and, and we have customers that, that, that are operating globally that, that have up to like 12 different instance families that they need to maintain, you want to reduce the number of versions just to keep the complexity low. Um, you want to standardize on what Atlassian calls enterprise versions, which is basically um, like one or two versions per year that they dedicate um, to get uh, long-term support. So it's basically the same, uh, the same application as all the other versions, but Atlassian backport security patches. So if one of those enterprise services uh, versions is affected um, by a security advisory, you can just like um, uh, backport it and, and don't have to upgrade to another major version, but just like a minor. Um, you want to limit customizations as good as possible. So if there's a business need for it, well, there's probably no way around it, but, but still you should always question if this really requires to be customized and on what level. Um, you should always have active maintenance, not, not because I want to sell you the licenses, but because uh, it can be a pain in the ass. If you have to up upgrade early and it's Christmas and there's no one in your procurement that can get you that license, um, so you want to make sure that, that you are actually on active maintenance if you have a larger installation. Um, you should always have some sort of uh, like up-to-date documentation if you do larger operations so that, that everyone, even Patrick mentioned proxy cases earlier, so if there's someone on leave or something, you should be able uh, to look up what you need to do to upgrade an instance, for example. Um, you want to know your metrics and KPIs, and we're talking about only like technical KPIs, but also your business KPIs. Like how many how many active sessions do we have at the moment? What what are the typical use cases that are performed uh, day to day within these? W what are the usual response times of creating an issue in a certain project? Um, and these kind of numbers can help you uh, to to check before and after an upgrade if if there is something that that really affects your performance. Um, you don't want to have your instance out in the wild if possible. So ideally, if you if you have the chance to limit access to a certain set of IPs um, within VPN access or something, you should do this. Um, uh, just because there's this one or two external vendors that you really need to, to work with, um, you need to consider um, if whitelisting is possible. You want to get fast SSDs. There's uh, use cases that are not very I.O. heavy at first. So for example, if you operate uh, a service desk that has to process roughly 50,000 emails a day, um, well, 
the first thing you probably think in scaling is not I need fast a faster drive, but in the end, just like processing these emails is super I/O heavy, and you run into uh, into performance issue just because your disk is slow. So you want to have fast um, disks, and then one thing that we learned very early is uh, carefully maximize RAM. Um, like you shouldn't just like put more and more to it just because it's possible. Um, because it only moves the point at what your application is failing. It doesn't really solve anything. Um, you want to have monitoring, so ideally you know, you want to know that you have a problem before your users know that you have a problem. So ideally if you can see that there is, um, I don't know, latency response times is going up before your users call, it's good, because then you can already take like proactive measures. Um, isolation, like I mean, we've we've mentioned that um, that case uh, with the crypto miner. Um, if you operate the application as root, you're doomed, because basically getting getting uh, getting that crypto miner out is nearly impossible because there's like 40 other scripts installed at places you do not know that will reinstall the crypto miner after you removed it. So ideally, don't run it as root. Um, and have some governance in place, especially when it comes to customizations. So you want to have some sort of governance concept that, that, that basically uh, rules who is able to do what within the instance and, and what customizations do you allow and whatnot. Um, and if, if I would ask how many of you uh, have a backup concept in place, there's probably nearly every arm going up. But if I ask how many of you actually validate your backups, not that many, I guess. So uh, ideally, just having the backups is good. Knowing that your backup concept actually works is better. Um, and you should audit logins. So either um, either there, there, there's some external appliance or, or any like threat detection or intrusion detection tools around, um, you should basically have an idea where your users are coming from and what is a normal pattern of operations. Like for example, if, if you see a spike in user logins from China, but well, you don't have any users in China, that's probably a problem. Um, and this is something that you want to see. And there's tools around um, that easily allow this. Um, yep, so I, I'm happy that my voice hold until here. So if you have questions, please find me afterwards or find us at one of those events. Um, so serverless days in Hamburg in a couple of weeks, or if, if it still is going on at Lessin Summit in Las Vegas. Um, or uh, yeah, we do have an event in June as well. Um, and there's also the Lessin Summit in Berlin in June. So yeah, um, we, we'll share that afterwards. Thank you very much.